Well, good morning. I would love to tell you that's a parody, but I know those people. Bill, you know those people too, don't you? Oh, goodness. Anyway, so today we're going to talk about the main thing. And here's what I want to do. Um, Peter Lord years ago took, took a phrase by a famous author and talked about how so often, if we're not careful, we'll lose track of where we're at. Do you know what this is? We haven't seen one of these in a long time. You have one on your phone. Do you know what it is? It's not a watch. It's a compass. Yeah. How many of you have ever used a compass? All right. So some compass users. But if I ask anybody below 20, they just look at me like, on my iPhone? You mean GPS? You know, what does that mean? So here's what they've discovered. Um, German scientists about 20 years ago did a study on people and found that people, when they don't have markers to tell where they are, like when the sun goes down or there's no moon and when they can't figure out where they are, you ready for this? They walk in circles. We literally walk in circles when we do not have a compass, when we do not know our direction. We tend to, there's something in us. And they used to think, and I even said it last night, they used to think that it was because one leg was stronger than the other. No, they just think it's because we don't know where we're at. So we tend to just kind of walk in circles. Now, here's the truth about life. If you aren't careful without knowing it, if you don't pay attention to where you're headed in life, you will be right back where you are today. Whether you struggle with a habit whether you struggle with a hurt, forgiveness, stress, worry, whatever it is, if you don't pay attention and ask God to show you, God, what really matters in life, you'll be right back where you are. And, and I'll tell you something that I say all the time, and it's absolutely true. God never fails us when we test. Never. Never. When you go through a test, God never fails you. He just gives you retakes. And so for some of us, you wonder, gosh, why am I dealing with this again? Well, you didn't pass last time. So you're back where you were. The good news is one day in heaven, there's no more tests. I'm always looking forward to that. You know, if you ask people, are you a Christian? If they're not Jewish, if they don't have another religion, if they're not Muslim or some other religion, they will look at you and say, yes, I'm a Christian. And then if you ask them, what makes you a Christian? Their answers will vary. But many times what they'll tell you is, I'm a good person, or I go to church a couple of, you know, maybe they're CEOs, they go to church on Christmas and Easter only, right, CEO. Uh, you know, maybe that's why they think they're a Christian, or, you know, they one time talked to a pastor, so that makes them a Christian. And so today what I want to talk about is, Jesus is dealing early on um, with some religious leaders who thought because they did these rules that it made them followers of God. And so the, Jesus first lists the rules, and the guy's like, yeah, yeah, I do that. And then he says, who's my neighbor? And Jesus gets a little more specific. Now, so there's three questions I want you to look at for your life today. Here they are. Number one, do I believe the Bible? Do I believe what the Bible says? Number two, what things do I avoid or people do I avoid? And then... Number three, where do I invest? And in your notes, it says time and money, but we added love because you can invest your time and money and have a wrong heart. I see that all the time. So we threw that in there. <clears throat> so here's the first question. By the way, I forgot to take my allergy pill today. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm not coughing. Don't worry. All right. Thanks, David. I appreciate the input. All right. How do you know what matters to you? How do you know what matters to you? Number one, do you believe the Bible? On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? So even Jesus went back to the Bible and said, what? I know this is going to drive you crazy. What does it say? By the way, if you're watching, we, I dropped a peppermint. What does it say in the Bible? So Jesus takes him back to scripture and says, what does it say? By the way, if you didn't know, we've gone from Moses bringing tablets and then we wrote the Bible on scrolls, and then we went to printing press and paper, and now we're back to tablet, just in case you didn't know that. All right. He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. That comes from the Old Testament, by the way. And with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. And then the guy says to him, but he wanted to justify himself 
So he asked Jesus, who's my neighbor? And when it says this, he wanted to justify himself. That means he wanted to prove that he was innocent. And so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus looks at the guy and says, hey, if you want to, you've got to know what direction you're heading. If you want to know if you really love God, do you love God and do you love people? If you want to do what the law says, are you on the right course? See, too often we just think we make our own rules. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just make your own rules? I mean, I'd love to, and most people on I-95 are trying to. Have you noticed that? Now, if I'm in the left lane and I'm going over the speed limit, not that that ever happens, but if I just happen to be And somebody comes running up behind me. Can I tell you, they are a maniac. But if I'm in the left lane and somebody is going the speed limit, what a jerk, right? Isn't that funny how we want to make the rules for ourselves? And yet Jesus looks at this man and says, hey, love God and love people. That's a great answer. So the guy says, yeah, but but who really is my neighbor? Your beliefs impact your priorities and your action. Is that, are all the notes not there anymore? We broke them. We broke the computer. Sorry. So the next thing, if you want to look at your piece of paper, your beliefs impact your priorities and your action. Here's the truth. Listen, and I love this. Peter Lord said this years ago, what you believe is what you do. The rest is just religious talk. You can claim to be whatever you want to claim. You can stand in a garage and say you're a car, but you're not a car. You can stand in the garage. You can honk and you're still not a car. You can come to church and you can sing, but that doesn't make you a Christian. You can come to church and you can give, that doesn't make you a Christian. Do you really act on what you believe? So Jesus talks to this guy and says, okay, it's not just knowing these things in your head. Okay, you know that you love God. You know that you want to love people. So then Jesus really challenged him. And Jesus is kind of mean in the way he does this because Jews did not like Samaritans. And Jesus over and over would make the Samaritans the heroes in his story. So number two, what do you avoid? See, the guy, instead of asking who my neighbor is, should have been asking who can I be a neighbor to. The truth is, if you're not careful, what you'll do is you'll only notice things that come to you instead of paying attention to what and who are around you. God's put people around you that you and I are supposed to minister to, but if we're not careful, we don't even pay attention to those people. I want to show you this picture from 9-11. Now, this is from the 9-11 memorial, and uh, I don't know if you can see this guy's name on this one, but it's Richard Rescorla, and I probably pronounced his name very badly. So Jenna, for her senior year, wanted to go to New York City. So we went to New York. We went to the, the... the monument here and the uh, memorial, and I randomly saw that rose, and I thought, I'm going to just take a picture to post and talk about what an awesome experience this is. So I took a picture and posted it. One of my friends from high school texted me, said, how do you know him? I said, what are you talking about? I just randomly took a picture of the thousands of names. I randomly took a picture of this person's name. I saw the rose and it made me think, this is somebody's family. This is somebody's friend. This is somebody who made a difference. My friend texts me, he goes, no, no, you don't understand. My dad was in, and I think it's a battalion, forgive me for not knowing military terms very well. Uh, Rodney, forgive me for not knowing military terms very well. But um, he was actually, his dad was actually in the battalion that fought in Vietnam next to this guy's battalion. Next to this guy's troops. And so there's a whole story. There's a, apparently a movie called Band of Brothers that this guy is in. I had no idea of that either. But the story's even bigger than that. Listen to this. So, so this man was not only in Vietnam and not only saved a lot of lives in Vietnam, he became Morgan Stanley's security director in the Twin Towers. And he was kind of somebody that you probably wouldn't like if you worked at Morgan Stanley. Here's why. He required them to do fire drills every few months. And he would make the thousands of employees from Morgan Stanley go from their place in the building all the way down to the ground floor. If you worked at Morgan Stanley, he's probably the guy that you said, are you serious? We got to do that again. On the day the plane hit the other tower, over the speaker came 
the announcement to stay in the building. And this man heard that announcement and he did the same thing he did in Vietnam because in Vietnam he told the other commanders, ignore what they taught you, do this instead. And he saved thousands of lives. Once again, he said, ignore what the port authority is telling you to stay in the building. I want you to evacuate like we have already, always done. And so they did. And they believe because of what he said, over 2,700 Morgan Stanley employees made it out of the building. He went out of his way to care for others and in that lost his own life. Do we pay attention to the people around us and care about them or do we honestly just care about ourselves? You know, in America, mostly what we worship is not God. We worship recreation, if we're honest. We worship pleasure. We want to have movies. Even after 9-11 happened, I don't know if you remember, one of the things we were told is, you want to help our country, go spend money. I don't know if you remember that. And I remember thinking, that's our purpose? To the government, yes, that, by the way, just so you know. But what really is your purpose? Have you thought about that lately? 20 years after 9-11, we really need to pay attention to what really mattered. You know, as a pastor, I have a weird life. I go and I get to meet new babies and pray over them and say, God, thank you for this new life. But I also stand at people's funerals. And I still to this day have not had somebody say at a funeral, gosh, that person was so great at their job and were so happy that they worked late every night and did that. I haven't had anybody say that. You know what they talk about? Going camping. Going to the beach. The time they went out of the way when they broke down on the side of the road. That time that they came over, and this is, shows you where we live, in their airboat to help me out. Bless you, but if you sneeze again, you got to leave. That's the four times all you get. No, I'm just teasing. You sneeze as many times as you want. So Jesus looks at him, Luke chapter 10, verse 30 to 32, and says, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. A priest, oh, this is, this is my people. A priest happened to be, don't ever call me a priest. It's okay, I'm not a priest. But anyway, a priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man and the people who were there had to be on the edge of their seats. Okay, what did the priest do? He passed by on the other side. By the way, that's what you did for unclean people. You passed by on the other side. That was what you did for people who had leprosy. You passed by on the other side. And so, Basically, what the priest was saying is, that guy's a sinner. He must have done something wrong, so I'm not helping him. And then it says, so too a Levite, another religious leader, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Let's just be honest. We avoid people or places or doing things that we don't love. If we're not careful, what we really worship is our own comfort. And we'll help if it makes us feel good. But as soon as it doesn't make us feel good to help, then we don't help anymore. Then are we really helping for the right reasons? If you only serve at church until somebody says something to you you don't like. If you only come to service until they don't have a song that you like. If you only come to service until there's a sermon that you don't like. That could be today. Then are we really doing the things for the right reason? If you only help people when they respond properly. Let me tell you something about getting people out of ditches that maybe you didn't know. Over the years, I've helped a lot of people out of ditches. And a lot of people like ditches. And I cannot tell you the number of times that I've gone and we've helped a family, helped a group, helped a man, helped a woman who were in a ditch. They were in a hard place in their life. They really needed help and went out of our way and got them out of the ditch, got them into rehab or got them into counseling, got them help, got them doing and go on the road they should. And I thought, praise Jesus, they are. And the next thing I know, they're back in the same ditch. And I have a choice at that point. Well, I don't want to help anybody out of a ditch. You know, the last time I helped somebody out of a ditch, they just got right back in it anyway. What a waste of my time. But I'm not called, and you're not called to work for people. You're called to do what God called you to do. Jesus taught that your highest priority must be your relationship with him. If anything detracts you from that relationship, that activity is not from God. God will not ask you to do something that hinders your relationship to Christ. I love that quote. Number three. So not only do you believe the Bible, what do you avoid? 
I can tell a lot about my life by the things I avoid. And then where do you invest your time, your money, and we add it on purpose, love? Where do you invest your love? Because you can invest your time and money and not care about something. Did you know that? You can invest your time and money and really not. You can, you can throw a dollar to that guy on the street and really you don't care about him. You just want him to leave you alone. I knew a pastor years ago uh, who carried uh, all the time a $20 bill in his pocket. And I, remember, I used to think, why in the world does he do that? And here's what happened. Somebody would come into the church that needed something. And instead of sending them somewhere they could get help, or instead of getting them somewhere they could get help, he would hand them $20 so they would leave. He didn't hand them $20 because he cared about them. He handed them $20 so they would leave him alone. See, our motivation is everything when we help people. Listen to what Jesus said. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Two things you'll notice here. Number one, he saw him. Did you know we don't even look at people very often anymore if we're not careful? I want you to take a minute. Just look around. Look around at people. If they're wearing a mask, they can wave. You can see their eyes. By the way, one of the things we've learned about masks is you can tell if people are smiling now. Have you noticed that? You can see the little crinkle in there. You see the crow's feet, right? So <laughs> we need to look at each other. And you know what's my, amazing? Just from you guys looking at each other, I can, I can, you're, you're a little more awake. Isn't that amazing how that works? Some of, y- some of y'all need to get out more often. All right, so here we go. So he, he looked at him, so he took, and then what did he do? He took pity on him. Now, this is not pity like just feeling sorry. This is he felt what the man felt. When's the last time you really felt what someone felt? He went to him, he bandaged his wounds, he poured on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to the inn, took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, a little bit of money, and gave them to the innkeeper. Then he said, look after him. When I return, listen, listen, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you have. And then Jesus says this, which of these three, was it the religious leader? Was it the guy who was ceremonial pure? Or was it the guy who didn't do all the things we thought they should do, but took care of the man? Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hand of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, Jesus wasn't saying to invest in people so much that you enable them. Okay, so this this is not saying you keep pulling somebody out of the ditch and they get back in the ditch and you pull them out again and they get back in the ditch and you pull them out again and they get back in the... It's not saying that. Sometimes you got to let people in the ditch so they can learn that they don't like the ditch, right? And we've all had a friend who maybe was an alcoholic or struggled with drugs that we sometimes had to let them learn. But the truth is, if we never help anyone out of the ditch, we're not being obedient to what Jesus said. So when's the last time you helped somebody out that was hurting? When's the last time you said, like Dave said earlier to somebody, hey, do you really know Jesus? Because the truth is, listen, as I went through junior high and high school, I was on youth leadership at a church. I went to church every week. My dad had taught us to give a percentage of what we made, and so we did that. I did all these religious things. And when my youth pastor one day said, are you a Christian? I said, yes. And he said, why? I said, because I made Jesus Lord. And he said, what does that mean? And I said, I don't know. Had I really put Jesus in charge of my life? That's what it means to make him Lord. And when I looked, I had to say no. I did religious things. I did things that looked religious, but I never really loved God with my heart. Have you done that? Because the truth is, you can sit in church every week, just like you could sit in a garage every week and not be a car. You can sit in church every week and not be a Christian. So I want to challenge you. Do you really love God? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. You'll do what I've called you to do. So are you being obedient to him? It's not talking about perfection. It's talking about surrender. Are you really surrendered to him? And as my senior year of high school, I had to come to the realization that I had not surrendered things to Jesus. I surrendered when it was convenient or when it made me look good. So I challenge you today, if you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, 
Maybe you've thought about it, or like me, you went to church for years and you were just playing a game, but you really want to surrender. Or, like me, at that time I said, I don't know. You might want to say, I don't know, but I want to know today for sure that I'm a believer. If that's you, the Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave Jesus so that whoever believes, whoever puts their faith in him, won't perish, but will have eternal life. If you're ready to put your faith in him today, you can do that today before you leave here. You can know that you're a Christian and the idea of being a Christian guarantees that your home is in heaven. So don't just go through life thinking, I think I know where I'm going. Get God's word out. Get the compass out. Make sure you're going the right way. Don't just wander in circles and think you're doing what's right. Surrender to him today. And if you're a Christian and the truth is you've let areas of your life slip where you know what the Bible says, but you don't want to do it. Hey, just surrender it to God. It doesn't mean you'll always get it right. Just surrender that area to him and ask him to help you to walk straight again. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these moments. I thank you for your word and your power. Lord, I pray in this world where we're full of distractions, where we seek pleasure sometimes more than we seek you, where we, we seek entertainment more than we seek you, when we seek luxury more than we seek you, Lord, forgive us. I pray we'd return to seeking you first. And Lord, I pray in the middle of that also that we would realize that we have neighbors all around us, people that you have called us to love. And Lord, help us not to walk on the other side. Father, give us those opportunities to reach out to those neighbors, to those friends, those people that are in the next cubicle. Lord, to go out of our way to help them find their way home to you. Lord, I pray if anyone here or anyone watching online doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. Lord, I also pray for those of us who have allowed things to sneak into our lives that are causing us to wander in circles. Lord, forgive us. We surrender those things to you. Help us to walk straight with you. In Jesus' name, amen.